Let's talk Mavs Thunder, Logan. Should be a hell of a series. I think these last four teams out West are all so good. I do think Denver and Minnesota are the best, but these two are also very, very good. What's the first key that stands out to you looking at this series? The first key to me, Carson, is uh, this is a boring one, but it's really important. I think it's how Ma uh, how Oklahoma City uh, battles on the glass against Dallas, man. Mm -hmm. I think physically on the low block, I think it's going to be uh, really important. The Thunder win the regular season series 3-1. to one. Uh, They soundly win a couple of these games. They put up a lot of points in these matchups. Uh I think it's one important. of them, one of them, to be fair, literally nobody played for the I was, Mavs. Yeah, I was going to say, Luca only plays two games in this series. Kyrie only plays two games in this series. P.J. Washington never plays. Obviously, uh, you know, they make no, the big... No, P.J. played. I'm pretty sure P.J. did not record... Uh, P.J. Let played. Me, let me fact I was, check I was that. Oh, P.J. got... P.J. played two games. I'm tripping. He played both um, games post-trade. Post-trade. So, two of these games, uh, we get, you know, new-look Mavs. Two of these games, we get old-look Mavs. I'm really concerned about how Oklahoma City is going to fare just in terms of physicality um, and size. Like, the, the Oklahoma City Thunder just don't have a lot of big players. Like, Chet Holmgren, in, in terms of height and in terms of weight, they've got dogs. They've got athletes. And that is one of my favorite qualities about Oklahoma City. They fight. They grit. They play hard. All of their guys are committed to making winning basketball plays and winning efforts. And they've got a lot of plus athletes, and they've got fresh legs, but – you're going up against a Dallas team that has a lot of physical outliers in comparison to you. You got Daniel Gafford on the inside, who ate. You got Derek Lively, who is a supreme athlete. You have got uh, Maxi Kleba you can turn to in spots, who's really strong and has a low, uh, you know, he can just, he can big body a guy like Chet, I feel like. Um, and then you got, you know, Jones Jr. and P.J. Washington on the wings, just really athletic big wings. Dallas was number 25 in rebounds per game pre-Gafford trade. They were number six post-Gafford trade. They were top five in rebound rate. This is an Oklahoma City team that was number 27 in rebounds per game and number 28 in rebound rate, man. I just think that's a big mismatch where I think that Dallas is going to dominate the glass and dominate inside on the interior. And Oklahoma City just doesn't have a lot of varied guys they can throw at them. Um, I think it's crucial that uh, Oklahoma City battles there, man, but it's a distinct advantage that – I think Dallas is going to have just in terms of personnel. They uh, Oklahoma City's really slight, and you know people have harped on Oklahoma City's inexperience. Carson is a big red flag for them. Mm -hmm. Their inexperience really isn't a as big a factor. I think this team's ready. Uh, it's the size. It's that's the biggest concern for me for Oklahoma City is the physical mismatch that Dallas is going to have over them on the interior. Absolutely a key dynamic to watch. And I think specifically the Gafford matchup is key. He was so good across the two real meetings that we saw between the Mavs post deadline and the Thunder. He averaged 18 points and 12 boards in just 22 minutes. And I do think that Chet is outmatched physically just in terms of strength and more so on the glass. Like Chet, as incredible as he is as a defensive five, isn't a great rebounding five. But what's much more concerning to me is the non-Chet minutes because that's when they're going real small ball, right? You're getting Jalen Williams at the five looks, talking about J. Will, not J. Dub. And whenever Chet was off the floor in these matchups, Gafford is just going over the top, man. Just going over the top as a lob threat who they really have no answer for. And Luca was feeding all their athletes around the rim. In transition, they're getting good looks around the bucket. They had this one beautiful play where they ra they ran Spain pick and roll. Then they had PJ Washington, who was the screener. Uh, Kyrie set a flare screen for him. PJ cut for a lob, and there's just no resistance on the back end. So Luca was getting downhill. He was abusing that lack of rim protection in the blowout that Dallas won right after they made the trades. OKC was minus three with Chet on the floor. They were minus 32 with him off. Of course, single game plus minus, you can only do so much with. But I think him being on the floor is so, so crucial because they're just losing too much size against a team that does have legitimate centers, legitimate big centers throughout this matchup. So I think Dallas should lean into that size. Like, I want to see a real center on the floor Basically all game, even as OKC, of course, is defined by their ability to go small and go five out and play in space. Like, I just think there's a lot of ways to make that work for Dallas defensively, because I don't think Gafford and Lively are dudes who get abused in space. And especially 
if Josh Giddy is on the floor and Josh Giddy is not knocking down his spot up jumpers and is just lacking confidence offensively, we have seen them. Well, it was sort of a uh, split experience this year because game one in which they had Gafford on Giddy post trade, Giddy was awful. He was three of 14. He couldn't knock down his spot up jumpers. He was bricking his floaters and that made everything so hard on the OKC offense. Driving lanes are congested. You have Gafford in that full-time Roma role, like where he's just going to be much more effective than if he has to guard Chet out to 25 feet because Chet's an amazing shooter. The second time, Giddy was much better offensively. So he is just going to be a key player in this series. But because of uh, the uncertainty that you have with him offensively, or at the very least, the fact that I still think you can put the five on him, even if he is knocking down those shots, I would rather have Gafford on him because, okay, Gafford has to step out to the corner a little bit further. I think you're more worried about Chet as a shooter. And I thought PJ has done a good job on Chet. And I think Chet has to be aggressive offensively, especially as a shooter, because of uh, the efforts to pull these guys out of the paint when they are matched up with him. But size is absolutely going to be a factor in this series. And what we get from the centers will be very important. It's one of the most important things in this series. And uh, I mistakenly said that they might have Kleba. I don't know if he's going to be back. I forgot he took that big yeah. fall. Uh, the other night where he landed on his shoulder. So he may be in this series. He may not be available. Um, I'm hoping he's going to be out there. That's just another big body they can throw at him. And OKC doesn't have that kind of depth. They just got Jay Will off the bench. The next question that I have about um, this series is, what can Lou Dort do against Luka Doncic, man? I think that's a key matchup to watch here. Lou Dort suffocated Brandon Ingram. Like, Brandon Ingram, I'll cut him a little slack, clearly not at 100%, you know, just came back. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be able to clamp. I don't think he's going to be able to lock up Luka at all. Um, I, I love Lou Dort. I think he's one of the best perimeter defenders on the planet. He matches up so physically well. But the reason he was able to so convincingly win against Brandon Ingram is because it's for a few reasons. One, Ingram's not a super physical guy. He's not going to give that back to Lou Dort. He's slight framed. He likes settling for jump shots. And Lou Dort knows that. So he can play into that dynamic a little bit more. And I think he held him to 29% shooting. I mean, just, just completely clamped Brandon Ingram up. He's not going to be able to do that against Luka. I think Luka is a way more tougher guard because he's deceptive. Like, there's just more to his game. He's more dynamic. He's Yes, Luka likes to settle for his jump shot, and if he shoots like he did in the first round, then I'm trying to bait him into that step back three as much as possible. In the regular season series, he wasn't, though. He got to it at will. He knocked down his shots, and then guess what? He weaponized that against Lou Dort later. That's what makes Luka such a hard cover. When he's banging his step back threes, well, then you got to respect it. You get him in the air. It opens up driving lanes and everything else. But specifically, too, Lou Dort, I don't think, is going to be able to win the strength battle as convincingly as he did against Brandon Ingram. Luke is a strong, stout dude. Like, he's going to work his way into the mid-range if he's smart. He's going to get downhill. I think Luca has to do a better job of that. He did in game six. Um, it just leads to easier offense. But that's the other key uh, matchup that I'm watching in this series, Carson, is how much can Lou Dort limit him on the other side? Because – he X'd out Brandon Ingram last series. I don't think he's going to be able to do that against Luka Doncic. I think Luka gets what he wants. Um, it's going to be big to see if his off-the-dribble jumper's hitting, but I think Luka's going to be the best player in this series, and I think he's kind of going to get what he wants. But Ludor's still a good matchup, man. He's still a, a oh, really great perimeter phenomenal. defender. Absolutely a phenomenal perimeter defender, and specifically one of the rare dudes who does have the low center of gravity and does have the strength and the physicality to where when Luca wants to, he can't just like bump that guy off his spots on drives. So in that sense, he is somebody who has the potential to force Luca to settle more, especially considering how much we saw Luca settle throughout this past series. So it's a really tough matchup. And I think just broadly, which team has the best player on the floor is going to be a massive key in this series. Cause we have two dudes who I think are, generally considered top five players, if not very close to it in SGA's case. And they're both going to draw tough matchups because Luca is going to have Lou. SGA is going to have Derek Jones Jr., who has been phenomenal defensively. OKC has just a bunch of great options, even when it isn't Lou on him, with J-Dub, with SGA, with Aaron Wiggins, with Kaysan Wallace. Like, all those dudes on individual possessions are just really good perimeter defenders. Maybe not all of them have the size and strength for Luca, but... They're real plus defenders and they just have athletes and length everywhere and they don't stop working. Their pursuit around screens, their activity and help. They just have dogs and they have athletes. But when I consider that dynamic between Luca and Shea, 
I just see more absolute dominant takeover potential with Luca. I see a higher ceiling because of the physical imposition that he does still have because of the fact that he's one of the best playmakers on the planet. And I just trust him more as a decision maker in that way. I trust him to create more great shots for his teammates than I do SGA. And also because of the volume that he can potentially kill you with from deep. Now, that was much more of a problem in the first series than it was a good thing because he was missing all of his step-back threes. He was 24% from deep. That just murdered his efficiency, 52% true shooting, and he was settling too much. But the fact that this guy can take 10 threes a night in a series and make 40% of them and then also get downhill consistently and rack up assists, feeding his teammates, shooters, and lob threats alike, that's just what Luka can do when he's on. He's the second best offensive player on the planet. And SGA, as consistent as he's been, we know doesn't quite have that explosive ceiling to the extent that a Luka does when everything's going. And although this was a rough series from Luka, I thought it was a really bad start. What I was so encouraged by is over the last two games, he made 15 shots inside eight feet. So even as his jumper still wasn't falling, he was much more consistent getting downhill into the teeth of the defense. That's where he's most effective. It still remains to be seen if he can play up to his best level and if his knee is 100% and he has to shoot better. But I was just encouraged by that. Lou is going to hound him. Lou is going to make him work. All these dudes are going to make him work. But if he commits to getting downhill, if he isn't content settling, it's Luka Doncic. And he's one of the best offensive players that we've ever seen. SGA, I've been a huge advocate for. I think he really scales well to playoff environments because of how consistently he can get to his spots around the free throw line, how many counters he has there, how great he is as a shot maker on top of downhill pressure. It's what you see with Ant, right? When a guy can get to the rim at will and then also murder you as a pull-up shooter, there's just nothing that you can do with that guy. But Luca's ceiling is higher. Derrick Jones Jr. is a great matchup. And again, Josh Giddy is key in this series. If he's on the floor, the thing is, if he sucks, you just take him off the floor. But like, if you do have those congested paints with Gafford out there consistently in help, like it's just going to force you into some of those tougher twos with SGA is great at, but that can't be your entire shot diet. So I do expect Luca to be the best player in the series. And the other key dynamic in terms of how these stars are going to play is the level that Kyrie Irving has been at for Dallas, because the guy's just been playing out of his mind last 15 games, 27 points per game on 66% true shooting from Kyrie last series. He shot 53% for mid range, 45% from deep and averaged 20 points per game in second halves. There were just stretches where he was completely unstoppable. And OKC has great perimeter defenders to throw at him, but he's just at such a special level as a shot maker that it really doesn't matter, right? You can't take away pull-up threes, man. Like, he's just doing his thing at such a high level. And as much as I love J-Dub, OKC doesn't have a weapon like that. The fact that Kyrie could... Be the best offensive player in this series. We're talking about Luka versus SGA. I think it's quite likely that it's one of those two. It's not out of the question that Kyrie outplays both of those guys offensively. He was just the best offensive player in a series with Luka Doncic on the floor. And that is just a meaningful difference to me. OKC has so many quality basketball players. They have three stars, whereas Dallas has two stars. But their second and third stars to me are in that like 30th to 35th best player range. And they're not going to overwhelm you with volume. Kyrie is playing like a top 15 player. And that is a crucial dynamic for the shot creation and the dynamism of this Dallas offense. Kyrie can just ignite, man. He can just turn it on and yep. take over in an instant. You know, he doesn't need that. It's weird. You see the flip of the switch and boom, it's on. That's a huge key, Carson, because... Luka and Kyrie could be one and two in this series, but also I don't think OKC has the the personnel to slow him down, right? To throw at J-Dub and SGA, you got PJ and you got Derrick Jones Jr. And that's a great recipe, but, you know, I don't know. You got Lou Dort on Luka. I don't know who oh, you throw I disagree. Kyrie, I think I actually think OKC has way really? better perimeter options defensively. I think you can put basically all the dudes we discussed on Kyrie and they're going to do a good job. I think J-Dub's a good matchup. I think Aaron Wiggins, Kaysan Wallace off the bench are good matchups. The problem is just what Kyrie does, man, is absurd jump mm -hmm. shooting. It's absurd displays of skill. He's just going to create himself enough space with a ridiculous dribble move, with his balance and body control, and then he just doesn't miss. Like 
it's to me not a question of personnel. And I don't think that PJ is going to be taken on J Dub. I think what they're going to try to do is Gafford mm -hmm. on Giddy or Lively on Giddy, PJ on Chet. And then I think it's going to be Kyrie on J-Dub, which is interesting. And then I think you're going to have a healthy dosage of Josh Green and Dante Exum minutes. I just think they need PJ's mm -hmm. size, ideally, on Chet or involved as a helper. And I don't think that he's quite quick enough for just the crazy level of shiftiness that you get from J-Dub. You think they're going to leave Gafford uh, or do you think they're going to leave Giddy on an island all series long or at least a first game? I think that they are going to try to have the big in the Roma role as much as possible. And Giddy was eight of 13 in his last two games from deep. Mm -hmm. So if he does that, then you can't do it. But I think that that is the approach that they will start with. I don't love Kyrie on J-Dub. I know Kyrie defended his ass off last series. Like you see the stat in game six, he holds opposing players to two of 18 shooting from the field. I don't know about that one, man. That matchup kind of scares me if I'm Dallas. It's not a great matchup. Kyrie has been defending well. Like, he just had a really good series, made so many plays with his hands and his instincts, and was just consistently quite engaged. It was an impressive showing for him. I think people shot, like, 39% when he was the primary mm -hmm. defender. Small sample size, there's variance there, but you felt it. He was quite good defensively in that series. But J-Dub is bigger, and J-Dub is physical, and J-Dub is more athletic, so it is a challenge. I just think your best defensive configuration still involves Kyrie on him, because mm -hmm. then you have your best guy in help in Daniel Gafford. And so if he does get a step, if he is getting into that painted area, he's more likely to settle or he's going to be challenged at the rim mm -hmm. at the very least. Because I don't think anybody here is just going to like consistently stay in front of J-Dub. Outside of Derek Jones Jr. could, but you have to have him on SGA. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting dynamic to watch, man. And this is a boring key, but, uh, you know, shooting is going to be a huge part in this series too, man. Uh from behind the arc, just Luca is always going to generate good looks for his teammates. That's a beauty of playing with a guy like him is that a, the way he collapses the defense, the way he kicks out, he's such a phenomenal passer guys over help. He just generates great looks for his teammates. I think shooting is going to be huge in this one, man. They lose Maxi Kleba potentially. So that's another good, reliable shooter that Dallas has that uh, may not be out there. Tim Hardaway Jr. might come back. Um, if he comes back, I think that's a key for Dallas. I think they really, I think they need a guy like THJ. I mean, their shooting mm. is super inconsistent. Like if PJ and Derek Jones Jr. are hitting their stuff, I'm saying for stretches. You know what I mean? You give me a cool 18, 20, um, and hopefully can help swing it. Do you not you don't think he matters in this series or what? Well, I wouldn't describe it as a key. I do think that he is a dynamic shooting weapon, but I want to see more Dante Exum in this series because I do think that he's really good for that J-Dub matchup and he had such mm -hmm. a great shooting season. Like, I agree, there are a lot of spotty guys, but I also think your identity is everybody other than Kyrie and Luka. Mm -hmm. And even those guys were mostly engaged defensively and Kyrie was quite good their last series. But like everybody else is just going to defend their asses off. Mm -hmm. And when THJ is on the floor you lose at least one part of that dynamic. So I definitely don't think they need him. I think if everybody else is ice cold, he's a good option to have, but I wouldn't view him as a key player being available in this series. Their shooting just scares me. They shoot 33.5% uh, from behind the arc against the Clippers. That's down almost 4% from the regular season. And we just saw these stretches from Dallas where they did go ice cold for a little bit, where it was Kyrie having to take over. I don't know, man. Their shooting scares me, especially against a team that was the best uh, three-point shooting team in the regular season. Uh, Oklahoma City's just got a lot of guys. They run that five out. Everybody can shoot. Everybody can put it on the floor. It, Dallas scares me in a couple games where they could go ice cold. You're just asking a lot. You know, Luka goes cold from deep on his step-back threes. P.J. and Derrick Jones Jr. aren't hitting. Josh Green and Exum are spotty. Like, I know these guys have their moments. And I get what you're saying about the defensive identity, too, because – Luka and Kyrie, as hard as they've been trying, physically can be liabilities defensively. And so you need everybody else on the court to pick up that slack. I don't know. I think I think you need THJ to have a game or two, man, where he's picking up that slack. I feel like Dallas could go cold from behind the arc in a couple of these games. I will say a lot of their three-point shooting last series, when you mentioned that bottom line number, is just on Luka. Like the supporting cast, we saw they were an 81st percentile spot up 
team actually last series averaged over 1.1 points per spot up. And part of that is shooting, but part of that is also good closeout attacking where I thought particularly Derek Jones Jr. was good. So I agree there's inconsistency there. And I think it's always a possibility that teams just say, all right, we are going to force the ball out of Luke and Kyrie's hands and we are going to make anybody else beat us. Like anybody else beat us with your shooting, beat us with your decision-making. But I thought last series was fine. And I think that there are just more complete role players on this team than uh, a Tim Hardaway Jr. And especially when you have the challenge of guarding both J-Dub and SGA. Again, I'd be more inclined to see a Josh Green or a Dante Exum in those minutes, guys who I think are better options defensively. But I do think defensive consistency and just the level that these teams are at defensively is going to be a key throughout this series because OKC was phenomenal there every night against New Orleans. And they were phenomenal there very consistently throughout the regular season. They just have hounds in terms of perimeter defenders. I think the best perimeter defensive personnel outside of Minnesota. And then they have an elite rim protector in Chet Holmgren. They had the second lowest interior defensive field goal percentage allowed. That shot's inside of six feet. And I think a lot of credit goes to Chet there, but also the collective length. And they posted the best defensive rating in the first round against the shorthanded offense, not a good playoff offense, but they were stellar there. The Mavs though, are a really awesome defense when Luka and Kyrie are engaged. Like the ceiling that we've seen from them is super high as well. And Luka was more up and down last series, but I thought overall held his own. And they had the best interior defense, the lowest opponent field goal percentage allowed inside of six feet. So consistency just overall is a very interesting dynamic here. Because I do think OKC is the more consistent team defensively. I do think they're the more consistent team offensively. I think their effort never wanes. And because they don't rely as overwhelmingly on two star creators, like they just have more dudes who you consistently trust to handle and knock down shots. Having a Chet dynamic. Lou Dort even has been shooting the ball so well this year. And then off the bench, they have dudes who consistently defend and are great shooters like a case on Wallace and an Aaron Wiggins. Whereas we're talking about with Dallas, like you don't know what you're getting from these shooters night to night. It does depend. OKC, even when they were off again, it's against New Orleans. So it's different. It's not nearly as good of a team, but they still pulled through. Whereas Dallas digs themselves a couple of 30 point holes in first halves. So that's an interesting dynamic. However, I expect to get a more dialed in version of Dallas in this series. I expect to get a better version of Luka, even though it's a tougher matchup, just because I think he was bad because of his own reasons last series. And so I'm not as worried about it for Dallas as I was, but there's no denying that through four games, we were like, Dallas, you got to lock in. Like you can't play halves of games. You can't take nights off in the playoffs. You have to consistently play to your ceiling. And that ceiling is really awesome but they didn't consistently hit it in the first round. And OKC was closer to doing that. Oh, 100%. I mean, if, if they let off the gas on OKC, OKC is going to make them pay. Like, I think it starts, you know, head up. I think it starts with Luka. If you can get that engagement from Luka and Kyrie, I think all the other guys are going to buy in. You know what I mean? It was more mm – -hmm. I felt like in those games where – the rest of the Dallas team got disengaged. It was Luka missing step back threes, not competing defensively, you know, putting his head down like – and it was some red hot, you know, just shooting stretches from the Clippers too, man. They lit them up in those stretches. But yeah, I think it's huge. OKC is going to make them pay uh, if they do that. That being said, though, I I don't know, man. I think it's a I think it's a tall task for OKC to to overcome. Um, and I do think that Dallas has the highest ceiling. And that glimpse, that glimpse that we saw in the Clippers series, man, like right at the end, like Dallas looked like a, a championship contender and. I'm not saying a glimpse. Yeah. I mean, we saw a couple games, we saw a couple games, but you know what I mean? It wasn't consistent, but I think that this is a Dallas team that feels the moment they're hungry. They know that they got to get this done. And there's a window, man, that I think Dallas is for real. And I think they're just marginally the better team. I think I slept on Oklahoma city all year long. That's on me, man. Like I, I downplayed how good OKC was. I downplayed how many quality basketball players uh, they have, how well they play defensively how great they shoot that ball, uh, mm -hmm. the top-end abilities of their creators. But I believe in Dallas a little more, Carson. I'm going to go – I'm going to go Dallas in six. I think it's I think it's similar to the Clippers series. I think OKC steals them too, but I think Dallas is the better team. I'm going to take them to finish it in six. 
I'm going to take Dallas in seven, even though that requires them winning a game seven on the road, which is really hard to do just because that feels appropriate for the gap between these two teams. Because I do think OKC is just more consistent. We know what we're getting from them every night. And again, they do have three star level guys and they do have the more consistent role players. However, I believe in Dallas's superstar duo. And that is ultimately the key. They have two of the three best players in the series and there is a gap. Uh, Kyrie is just playing so damn well right now. I believe in that team defense when they're more consistently locked in. I believe that physicality advantage matters. I believe that size advantage matters. So I'm picking Dallas here as well. To me, at the end of that series, we saw the team that we bought in on at the end of the regular season. And they have to more consistently reach that level this series, but I expect them to do so. I do think it's going to be really, really, really fun though.